So what's the difference between static and dynamic orchestration? Well, static orchestration, that's what we did so far. So you decide what goes where, say this container goes on this machine, and it works fine until a given point. Um, my favorite way to explain why this is important is to imagine that you are an IT desk in a company, and so you have this little Xen or PVM or VMware cluster. Uh, so in the beginning, you have like four machines, and with maybe, I don't know, 60 gigs of RAM, one terabyte disk, and a few CPUs. And every week, uh, there is someone from the development team showing up and saying, hey, hello, I need VMs for this project, and I need like uh, two VMs with that much RAM and disk. And so you create the VM because you know that on the third machine you have some capacity, so you create the VM and you give them the, the IP address and login and password, and that's it. And then you're, you, you're, you're, you can have a good week until the next week until they come back to ask more VMs. And then later, you don't have four machines, but now you have hundreds of machines in multiple data centers, uh, and you have thousands of VMs, and now multiple times every day, you have different teams showing up and they say, I need 20 VMs in that data center, I need 40 VMs in that other data center, and 10 of them must have SSD disks, or I need 30 VMs but connected to this specific VLAN. And then you spend your time um, creating those VMs, and even just to know where you have capacity, it becomes complicated, because you, you can't just remember, oh yeah, you need, four, you need 50 VMs, I know that I can put three here, and five here, and eight here, uh, because even if you're Rain Man, that becomes pretty complicated. So the goal of dynamic orchestration is to do some resource scheduling and to automate that process, so that now your teams can have like a form where they say, I want that many VMs, click, 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 and when they do submit automatically, it speaks that data centers and hosts and everything and starts the VMs. Basically, you give them a provisioning API. So, um, with dynamic orchestration in containers, the point is that <coughs> we will get one big pool of resources and instead of deciding we want a container here and a container here and so on, we just uh, throw containers at the system and the system will put the containers where capacity is available. That's one, one question. Sure. You started on the static part, the story about VMs, and I totally get that and I see that very, very often. That's very recognizable. But then on container side, the containers don't really care about VMs. Right? As far as the right. container is concerned, it can be a bare metal server, I can strip out the... Absolutely. No, it's yeah, like, what's the connection with this VM story in the containers? Well, just imagine that instead of VMs, I say containers. Um, in the beginning, when you deploy containers, well, okay, I have this application, so I have eight containers, okay. and so I know I will scale that way, you know, as we did in the beginning. Now we have to imagine that we will have to deploy those kind of applications all the time, and we, we don't want to have to think about, okay, I'm putting this stack here five times, and yeah, that's, that's the idea. Um, <coughs> so the advantages of dynamic orchestration is that we, when, when you have many applications, many containers, um, you, you remove a lot of manual work. Um, let's be clear, if you just have a couple of applications, uh, dynamic <coughs> orchestration won't get you anything except a lot of trouble and headaches because you have a lot of extra components to get that to work, so if you deploy Mesos, Swarm, or Kubernetes, just to have a couple of simple applications, you're wasting your time. Now, dynamic orchestration will be really important when you have, I would say, <coughs> at maybe more than 10 applications, or more than 100 containers, mm -hmm. or more than 10 machines. You know, it's a combination of those parameters. At some point, basically, when you spend more time playing Tetris to fit all the containers together <coughs> than actually deploying, that's when you know you need dynamic orchestration. Yes? So a computer, computer consists of three components, network, compute, and storage. I assume that all the nodes have the same network bandwidth. So then you have to mix and match the, the storage and the compute. And that's a dynamic thing. Mm -hmm. So uh, one node could run here, on node, uh, one, one Docker container could run on node A, 
and they need more storage than available on that node. How do you solve that? Um, so how do I solve the problem if at some point I, I initially I needed such amount of storage and then I need more storage? I cannot, then I need to scale the storage um, for that container. So how do we solve that with VMs today? Uh, well, you have these systems where you can dynamically uh, migrate the ocean to another system mm -hmm. and the storage is also a uh, replicate of multiple systems. Yeah, so we so use exactly the same thing. So then you have a, so you have a separate layer for storage and for the uh, for the compute. So uh, all, all the techniques that we were using for VMs uh, can be applied to containers. Uh, if, for instance, okay, so how do I deal with let's say elastic storage? Well, I have some kind of SAN, or I'm using EBS or EFS or S3. With containers, I just use exactly the same thing. That that doesn't really uh, uh, change the the deal. Um, that's maybe maybe either of them about storage because containers they use a statement so they shouldn't change the statement and that means it shouldn't become bigger. Sorry, but he stated that but in the previous question yeah. about system containers, he said they, they don't need to be statements. Uh, so then, then he said you can use uh, dock containers for system containers. And those are not statements. If if we have stateful containers, then we for HA, and then we will use the same mechanisms as we are using for VMs. So, for instance, um, let's say I have a system container for a database, then I will make sure that var lib Postgres is on the volume that sits on a SAN, for instance. And that state is outside the container. Yeah. Ideally, uh, yeah, but so, uh, ideally I would make sure that the state is outside. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah. Let's talk about Vmotion like things here. So do we have something like Vmotion? Uh, yes and no. Um, there, there is something called CRIU, C-R-I-U, which is Checkpoint Restore and User Lane, which uh, lets us snapshot containers and migrate them, and it works like the, the core team did a demo uh, yeah last year, like moving quick three servers. It works, but it's not integrated yet in the engine. Um, there is a lot of discussion about what should go in the engine and what shouldn't. And currently, to give you an idea of the, the kind of, the, the, the current fashion, the trend, is that we don't want to continue to add more and more and more things into the engine. Because many people already think that this engine is doing way too many things. So for instance, for live migration, um, say, OK, almost nobody needs live migration on containers, because when you really need it, you can just live migrate the VM and problem solved. So some people, it's a, I mean, so, some people need live migration. It's not everybody. It's a small fraction. And in those people, the people who can't do it on the VM level are even fewer people. So what we decided is, okay, if you not if you need live migration on containers, then you you will use RunC, the low level component to run containers, uh, because RunC has support for that. And maybe later we will integrate that into the engine, but not yet, because we want to make sure you know it's when you add a feature then. Mm, it's, it's easy to add a feature, it's hard to remove it. So, okay. Um, so, I will uh, talk about a few um, dynamic orchestration systems um, Mesos, Kubernetes, and Swarm. Um, it's not an exhaustive list, there are other systems, so I will try to also quickly talk about those systems. Uh, Mesos, so Mesos is kind of the um, the the, the 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 grandfather of orchestration systems like that because it's now almost seven years old. Um, it's a two-level pessimistic resource scheduler. So this means two-level means that you have the Mesos master that knows exactly what's going on. It knows uh, which resources are available on which nodes, and then you have a second level of frameworks. And when you need resources, you don't directly talk to the master. You talk to a framework, and the framework then talks to the master. So that's why it's two-level. Now, pessimistic, 
means that uh, let's suppose that I'm the master and people are asking for resources and so when somebody shows up and say hey I want resources so I'm going to allocate to them a bunch of resources for them exclusively. If somebody shows up at the same time, I will give them another bunch of resources and those resources will not overlap. I will assume that when people, when people contact me, I'm giving them a lot of resources and they will give back resources to me because when they show up, I don't know exactly how many uh, resources they will need. Uh, I'm, I'm not doing like the fine grain work. It's like somebody shows up and say, hey, I need resources. So I say, okay, here is 1,000 cores and 20 terabytes of storage and 100 gigs of RAM. And I expect the framework to pick exactly what it needs and give back what is not necessary. And so I'm pessimistic. Pessimistic means that I assume that potentially the framework is going to take all the resources by itself, so I'm not giving the same resource to two different people. Otherwise, there could be a conflict. This contrast, for instance, to Borg, I should put some slides on Borg because it's very interesting to, to understand the contrast. Borg is a scheduler used at Google, and um, it's optimistic in the sense that it, it gives a bunch of resources. Uh, when, when you ask for resources, Borg gives you a lot of resources, and if multiple people come at the same time, they can get the same resources, and Borg um, assumes that conflicts will be rare. It's like... It's hmm? It's, sorry. It has quality church also. So, on the higher priority stays at the machine, the lower priority is kept Yeah, and then there is a priority mechanism, yeah, to make sure that, yeah. But, um, <coughs> it's, it's, it's two very different set of assumptions, um, where, it's pretty hard exactly to, to have the full history on Borg because I think it was started at Google in maybe 2005, six something like that. Um, Google released a few papers on Borg recently when there was a lot of mm, things happening around orchestration. So now the way that Borg operates is fairly well known. Um, and it's very different from Mesos. And it's pretty funny because when you, when you look at experts on Mesos and Borg, they say, yeah, we use pessimistic thing because very good reason. And then they'll say, well, we use optimistic thing because other good reasons. And it's like, uh, and they both run or compute workloads and both things seems to work because, well, Borg is the thing that makes Google work, so obviously it works. And Mesos makes, uh, Twitter, Airbnb, and a few other things like that work, so obviously it works too, but it's just two different ways to, uh, to, to, to architecture things. So, back to Mesos, we have this master thing that, is, that knows exactly the state of the cluster, then we have slaves that are things on, on each machine of the cluster, you have the slave that reports back to the master to say, okay, I have that much resources right now, and then you have those frameworks. Containers were initially not a concept in Mesos. Mesos was just starting processes. So you would, for instance, you would talk to the Marathon framework. Marathon framework is the framework used for long running processes. And you would say, I want to run 80 copies of uh, Java dash jar blah 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 dash this option dash blah blah blah. And it would find 80 nodes um, and it would run that command there. So it assumes that this command is available on all the nodes. Um, this, this helps to understand why uh, containers were really exciting for Mesos. And here, um, I'm going to say it's not exactly just containers, but it's more like Docker and the image format. Because with Mesos, if you want to run an application on your cluster, the first thing is to make sure that the application is present on the whole cluster. So you need some distributed file systems or some really good deployment scripts. If you're using something like Docker, you can say the command that I'm going to run is docker run jpetadzo slash my nice image and it will automatically pull the image from the registry. So the whole problem of setting up a distributed file system or deploying my code all over the cluster, this problem is suddenly solved. So, that, so that's why um, Docker and Mesos were kind of a really good match. 
Um, the downside is that since initially Mesos was just running processes, adding containers was kind of um, not a super good match. Um, it's getting better, but in the network and service discovery side, it, it, you can still see that it, I mean, you, you can't just take a compose file and throw that at the Mesos cluster and expect it to work. What you can do is have a nice container image and you can tell to Mesos, run me 200 copies of that container. That will work. So for instance, um, remember when we did Docker Compose scale, that specific part works great, except your container um, needs the information to connect to the rest of the platform. So it's great for uh, compute workloads, uh, it's great for uh, it's great if you already have a Mesos cluster, not so great if you want, like, let's say, the full worker <coughs> experience, if that makes sense. Um, what the, the feedback that we got from people using Mesos and Docker together is that when you already have a Mesos cluster and uh, you want to run containers, it's super easy. You just add the Docker Swarm framework and now you can run containers. Um, you don't get the full API, but get started really quick and it's good if you want to have mixed workloads so you want to have docker containers but you also want to use the other Mesos frameworks like Marathon, Kronos, Aurora and so on and so on. If you only want to run docker containers like if, if docker containers are the primary thing you want to run it's not such a great idea to deploy Mesos because it's not perfectly fit for it. Um, Kubernetes, so Kubernetes is more recent um, but it was designed from the very beginning um, to be a platform for containers. So uh, instead of having lots of legacy mm. concepts that, okay, it's only for containers, um, a few important <coughs> Kubernetes concepts is that you have pods. A pod is a group of containers and those containers share the same network, the same storage. So. Remember when we did the ops section, okay, so we have the application container and then we had like logins and backups and network analysis and this and that. Um, in Kubernetes, all of those things are members of the same pod. Then uh, you have replication controllers, which are little components that are responsible of making sure that the right number of containers are running at a given time. Like, you, like when I went when with, uh, with Compose, when you did the Docker Compose scale walker equal four, we bring four walkers, but then if some walkers go or come back, nothing happens. With Kubernetes, you get the replication controller that you say, okay, I want four instances of this, and the replication controller keeps track of what's running, and if you get uh, like a NOS goes down, so oh, we only have three containers now, the replication controller brings that up to four. Now the ups comes back, and if you have five containers, it will bring it down to four. Um, it uses tags pretty extensively. That seems like a little detail, but the kind of traditional approach was to have a tree of resources, and sometimes you don't know exactly in which order things should be. Like, should I have application one, application two, application three, and then under that, like, dev, prod, dev, prod, or should they have dev, prod, and under each, application one, two, and three. Mm -hmm. um, Kubernetes works around the issue by having tags. So you can have um, like stage equal prod, stage equal dev, and then app name equal app one, app two, and so on. So, and, and then you select your containers with tags. Um, Kubernetes was initially designed around Docker, but they did not hesitate to uh, uh, break away from the Docker concepts when they deemed it necessary. So in practice, um, <coughs> the, um, there is a really powerful um, network mechanism, but it's also pretty complex. For instance, when you want to communicate between containers within the same pod, you do it over local host. If it's within an application, you use the overlay networks. If you uh, serve uh, inbound traffic, uh, it's yet another mechanism. So depending on whether you're talking to services inside or outside a pod or receiving traffic from uh, the application or outside, 
you, you handle that differently. So that's something that the application developer has to uh, account for. Um, it was initially designed around GCE, so the, the, the EC2 of Google, if you will. Um, I haven't deployed Kubernetes on AWS recently. I've heard that it got much better. Uh, but uh, at least six months ago, like the, the overlay networks and the storage of AWS were so-and-so. Um, the, um, <clears throat> there is a big trend that I see like happening right now. Uh, the, um, for instance, last week I, I was, uh, no, earlier this week I mean, because we are Friday, um, I was in Paris at a kind of internal meetup organized by a kind of uh, managed hosting company. And uh, they organized this to ask us the mm -hmm. questions. And um, in fact, it turns out that one year ago, they were like most ops people, that the containers, no, that's bullshit, we don't want containers. This Docker thing is just a, a buzzword and you will see in six months, nobody will talk about it anymore. And one year later, it turns out that they were wrong, people are still talking about Docker, <laughs> but yes. And so now they have all their customers asking them, okay, we want to do Docker stuff, what, what can you do for us? And they're like, uh, we have no idea because we have ignored containers for why so and so what they do is say okay how do we do containers in production and they, they get Mesos they get Kubernetes and they say okay those things seem pretty stable so let's deploy that and then what they provide to their customers is not exactly docker it's Kubernetes and so when the developers show up uh, with a compost file it doesn't work so the key thing to with Kubernetes is that it's a container platform, but it's not Docker. So it means that when you want to deploy your application, like the Docker Cons application that we had, if you want to deploy that on Kubernetes, uh, you have to write a lot of extra glue and configuration around it, because this application, it's, it's, a, it's a Docker application with a Compose file. It's not a Kubernetes application. And uh, six, 12 months ago, the difference was not very significant because six, 12 months ago, people were using Compose in dev, and then in prod, it was a bunch of scripts put together to start the containers. But now we are starting to use Compose in production. There are integrations between Compose and Swarm, and then there is a kind of gap. And so um, if you are deploying Kubernetes for a dev team, you have to make sure that the dev team is aware that they have then to provide uh, basically what is a Kubernetes application, not a Docker application. Um, and the, the two are very different. Um, just look like, if you, if you want to see what I'm talking about, just look in the Kubernetes repo in the samples and look at the configuration files that are necessary to bring up like Elasticsearch of Casper or Cassandra. And for each service, you have a bunch of YAML files to describe what are the exposed ports and what are the policies to get all that. and. Um, so that, that's something to keep in mind. Um, honestly, if, if today I were in the situation where my, like, uh, let's say I'm in the IT department and my CTO says we are deploying Kubernetes and my developers say we are using Docker, I would very quickly get working on writing a bunch of scripts to transform Compose files into the config files that Kubernetes is expecting. Because if the developers have to do that manually, they're going to have a bad time. All right. <clears throat> so Swarm. Um, oh, and don't get me wrong. This is not to, to say anything bad about Kubernetes, but just to clarify, because some people think that if they have developers using Docker, they need to just set up Kubernetes and everything will work. No, there is a, a huge gap between both uh, to make sure that deployment can happen easily. That's the question that it gets easier in Kubernetes. Yes. Because you were talking about the best of that one, that's the Kubernetes. So, so it's, well, it's all first class citizens. Yes and no. I mean, I will just show the, the thing I was talking about earlier because uh, where is it? They also have all the other things. They also have all the other things. Yeah. It seems which are already there for one time. So, for instance. Yeah. To, to run Cassandra on Kubernetes, um, you need this config file and also, uh, 
why this doesn't work. You have another here, and then another here, and then another here. So just for one service, you already have almost 200 lines of YAML. So if you want to have Cassandra in your app in Kubernetes, you need to have this in your application. You get high you get the cache controller, you get the load balancer, and otherwise you have to invent it yourself, like you did with the Yeah. So that's why it's normal. Yeah, but it's the if if developers are expected to do that, the the, the problem is that um, the developers won't write that. So well, and as the ops team, you need to get what the developers did and transform the application into a Kubernetes application. And this is not a trivial job. And, and as of today, it's pretty hard to automate. Because um, like the, the ambassadors that we saw earlier, like when we, when we scaled, for instance, RNG, um, it's, if we had to write the code to replace RNG with RNG123, I think that would be like 10 to 15 lines of Python. So we can't write generic code to say, take this compose file and scale this service into an instance. That's pretty easy. Now, if we have a compose file and I say, okay, you have to write the YAML files corresponding to that, like, I, I'm not sure that it's that easy to do. But you don't uh, scale out uh, Cassandra clusters on demand. You need to uh, buy additional uh, box, you need to put mm -hmm. it in the rack, you need to configure it. So that doesn't happen uh, 10 times a day, oh, that happens that once a month or week. Or that was one example, uh, but we can, take, we can take any other here. Like, so Cassandra uh, is not really the thing that needs auto-scaling. <laughs> Same with Elasticsearch, you need to, well, okay, Elasticsearch has different uh, use cases. Like, what I mean is that for every service in the application, you need to generate this YAML thing. And that's something to keep in mind. Like I've seen, uh, I've seen big recommendations on uh, people actually uh, using Elasticsearch over Mazes. Mm -hmm. uh, they tried to use it over Kubernetes, they were happy about it. And now uh, the uh, guys who do large scale containerized implementations for big uh, customers like 10,000 data containers, whatever. Uh, they are looking at the uh, Coros RKT. <coughs> so, uh, like, uh, they tried. So, basically, their feedback is like, we kind of afraid to use Swarm, uh, afraid to use Swarm, uh, and otherwise, uh, so otherwise, we'll use Coros products because uh, you know, we will have more uh, integrations. Thankfully. So, what would you say to uh, Swarm versus uh, RKT? Um. I don't know anybody using Rocket in, in production or even evaluating it, so I, I don't know. Okay. Uh, I, now that there is Run-C, I even don't see why anyone will use Rocket at all because it's, I mean, um, feature by feature, Run-C has the same features, except Run-C can use Docker images and Rocket can't, so. Mm -hmm. But um, on, on, on the Swamp thing, I mean, my point here is not to say, oh, Kubernetes is bad or whatever, it's just to warn people. Uh, ops people, usually, that's what I put like, uh, where is it? Yeah, tends to be loved by ops people. Uh, ops people like Kubernetes because, as you said, it has replication, availability, load balancing, it's solid, it works, it's written by a bunch of folks at Google, so hopefully they know what they're doing. Um, but that's ops. On the dev side, Devs hate Kubernetes because getting an app to run on Kubernetes is extremely complicated complete, compared to what it is on Swarm. So then, what we what's happening right now is that on the Swarm side, um, we are trying to get all those features as well: high availability, automated load balancing, and on the Kubernetes side, I hope that they are also trying to get to the developer side and to make something that is easy to use for developers. How about the affinity? So for DBA side, uh, so I'm uh, like looking at these automation frameworks mm -hmm. from the uh, database administrator and designer and architect uh, perspective, and so, like uh, we need to know, like okay, we are running Elasticsearch clusters. So physically, uh, we'll, of course, we'll have five Docker machines, let's say, 
and three of those machines would, let's say, run uh, Elasticsearch instances. So I want to be sure that actually, even if Elasticsearch is running in Docker, well, okay, but I would rather run it on machine by default, but I want to be sure that Elasticsearch is running machine number three, number four, and number five, and not three Elasticsearch nodes on one machine. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. So that thing is uh, addressed and uh, doing fine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, again, the, the main point is that if you are putting Kubernetes in production, you, you won't have production issues because it's stable, but you will have, I would say, um, cultural issues because your developers will be like, what do you want me to do with that thing? So, and, in, and the other way, if you deploy Swarm tomorrow, developers will be happy, but then on the upside, as of the state of things today, you will have a lot of extra work. Um, yeah, honestly, if I had to pick one for development tomorrow, I would say, let's try to hold off three more months or something until either Kubernetes gets easier for devs uh, or the Swarm HA features get there. So Swarm, um, the idea behind Swarm is to um, uh, capitalize on the Docker API. So Swarm takes a bunch of Docker engines and puts them together to pretend that it's one big Docker engine exposed with the Docker API. So all the tools that had been developed for Docker, um, the web dashboards, the stuff like Compose, all those things also work with Swarm. Um, in practice, so Swarm 1.0 was released just a few months ago. Initially, um, the, the, the way we were thinking about Swarm was, okay, this is for small clusters, like many people have clusters of 10 to 100 nodes, and it's really overkill to deploy Mesos and that, so let's have a solution for those people. And then, um, then we got the feedback about Kubernetes that was really complicated for developers to work with it, and we said, okay, let's do some load testing on Swarm, and so we deployed on 1,000 nodes and it worked, so we said, okay, we, we should stop to say that Swarm is just for small clusters because it works also great on big clusters. Um, Swarm today is perfect for some specific scenarios, like if you have Jenkins uh, build agents that will work beautifully out of the box, grid computing. Now there are some parts that are being uh, improved, like um, cross-host networking, uh, links, <laughs> builds, <clears throat> and if you want to achieve high availability, it requires a key value store. Um, so that's that's a pretty common thing, like uh, the Mesos requires Zookeeper, uh, Kubernetes requires etcd, and Swarm requires either etcd or console or Zookeeper. And that's the one that we will see in action now. All right. So, <coughs> there are two ways to uh, deploy a Swarm cluster. You can do that manually, or you can automate the process and um, if, you, if you have a secure network, uh, then you can very easily do a manual deployment. However, if you want to use TLS certificates, uh, I highly recommend to use automated deployment with machine because generating certificates is um, not a pleasant experience unless you were born with the OpenSSL man page. Um, so, <laughs> Docker Machine will take care of generating the certs, there, and also there are special certs that are like both client wall and server wall certs, and so on and so on. So, Docker Machine will do that for us. Um, for, I'm not sure what you mean by public experience. It's like for um, so, if, if we wanted to deploy, um, if you wanted to deploy a Swarm cluster without certificates manually, it's pretty easy. It's like okay, let's. Uh, you, you just um, start the Swarm Manager and then you st on each node you start the Swarm Agent and that's pretty much it, that's all. Um, now if you want security, you have to put TLS certificates and then you have to generate, so for each machine, well, first you need a CA, then you need on each machine um, TLS certificates uh, signed by the CA, then you need a special certificate for Swarm itself, and another special certificate to talk to Swarm. It's, it's only the same certificate, you need a signed by the CA. 
So it's all signed by the same CA, but it's different certificates and some of them have special flags. That, that's the part where, I mean, I know how to generate like, you know, the self-signed certificate for just a normal HTTPS website. I, I have a one-liner that I can copy paste in my terminal and I need one of those. Uh, and I, at first I thought, okay, you people are stupid. We just need to have this script to generate certificates and that will be fine. And that, well, no, it's a little bit more complicated than that because um, there is the idea of uh, kind of, I think, it's roles or something like that in certificate so that when you generate a, a TLS client certificate, it's slightly different and you need a bunch of options and OpenSSL is a little bit annoying so that you have to generate a config file and fit that to OpenSSL. So it's not the end of the day, but it's just annoying. <laughs> so <coughs> machine automates that. Um, so Machine is this tool that you can use to create Docker machines. So generally you create VMs, and th those could be local VMs, like you can create VirtualBox or VMware local dev VMs, but you can also put your uh, cloud credentials, like uh, EC2 <coughs> or DigitalOcean or, um, or OpenStack, and um, it will talk to your cloud to create VMs and install Docker on those VMs. And then you, you can use like Docker Machine LS to seal your VMs and Docker Machine RM and, and this and that. Um, so here, we will use a specific driver in machine, the generic driver. Um, the other drivers almost all have the same workflow. They use the, cl the cloud API to start a VM, and then they connect to the VM over SSH, and over the SSH connection, it, fin it finalizes the, the setup. With the generic driver, it does exactly the same thing, except it skips the VM creation. So with the generic driver, you give it the IP address of the machine, the user that it should connect to with SSH, and your SSH keys, and it connects over SSH, and it deploys Docker. So that's what we will use. Um, so what's in a swarm cluster? You need three things. A cluster discovery mechanism. So the, the discovery mechanism is the thing that will be used so that the, the swarm manager can know about the nodes in the cluster. Then there is the manager. The, the manager is the thing that you talk to and then it talks to the other nodes in the cluster. And then you have the agent. The agent is not mandatory, um, but it's the thing that runs on each node and will talk to the discovery mechanism to register the node. What do you mean by node? The container? So node, node here is a, a machine with Docker engine installed on it. So you have Docker engine installed and, and, and a special extra thing for Docker Swarm. So yeah, <coughs> on the cluster we will have, so we have well, our VMs, Docker is installed on the VM, and we have a, a super small container, uh, Swarm agent, okay. and that runs there and kind of uh, uh, continuously registers the node <coughs> to say, hey, there is a node running here, hey, there is a node running here. So for cluster discovery, we can use multiple different things. Um, there is static discovery, where you just give the list of nodes to the manager and that's it. Then there is dynamic discovery where you use um, Zookeeper, etcd, or console uh, to keep track of the nodes. So then the agent will talk to, for instance, your Zookeeper cluster to register itself. And then the manager can also talk to Zookeeper to get the list of nodes. Yep. I have a question regarding the discovery. Do you have a preference regarding etcd, Zookeeper, or console? Do we have a preference for service discovery? Um, I have a personal preference for console, but it's just me. <laughs> Not, uh, I mean, otherwise, um, it's my, my answer here is, is a little bit like for storage drivers. It's like use the one that you know best. Like if you already have experience with Zookeeper, use Zookeeper because you will be like, okay, just, we know it's Zookeeper, so we deploy it. Boom, it's done. If you have experience with etcd or console, same thing. If you have zero experience with like none of them, then. Uh, I would say, if well, you, <laughs> somebody <laughs> said not Zookeeper. Uh, well, yeah, Zookeeper, the code base is very poorly maintained, 
and Twitter dropped Zookeeper. So we're looking yeah. at the CD or console for that matter. So it's CD and console are in Go. Zookeeper is Java. Um, Zookeeper is the, the advantage is that is it's, it's really solid, but on physical, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and it's it's really great for physical machines because and again just my point of view, but um, you can see that it was made for physical machines because it's like okay this is my five node Zookeeper cluster, and if you want to add a node or remove a node, it's like no, <laughs> <laughs> you have to reconfigure everything and it's it's really a pain. While with its CD and console, it's like, yeah, sure, join the cluster and leave the cluster. And it's, it was built in the, in the protocol from the very beginning. So when you are with cloud machines and scaling up and down and you know, regenerating machines is a part of every day's ops things, uh, Zookeeper becomes really a huge pain and the others work better. But Zookeeper is also older so it's also kind of more robust you you have most likely to have less kind of cases many people hate zookeeper because they have seen the pain um, you have less people who have seen the pain with cd and console for instance um, i i tend to like console because i like the way it's designed um, i have a huge respect for hashicorp the people who did console i think they have seen the pain a lot yeah. <laughs> it seems like in all the products they make so <coughs> i have a kind of little personal preference for that but yeah and, and for instance if you're running kafka and as we said earlier kafka relies on zookeeper uh, then you need zookeeper anyway so then you might as well use the zookeeper that you have instead of deploying something <coughs> else so it depends <laughs> Um, and there is one last discovery mechanism, which is the, the hosted token discovery. Uh, this is when you want dynamic discovery, but you don't want to see the pain of deploying Zookeeper at CD and console. Then you can use, um, it's a kind of a, a highly available key value as a service thing that is operated by some of my friends in San Francisco. Uh, and the idea is that it's a little bit like a, a small S3 bucket in which your machines can register themselves. So if there is a simple API with the token mechanism. You can say token create, it will give you a unique ID that, um, that corresponds to your own bucket in, in the system. And then the agent can connect to this API, give the unique token and give its address and then it will be written in your private bucket and then uh, when the manager connects to that it gives the token id and the system gives it the list of machines so it's a little bit like a, a small shared whiteboard for your machines to uh, to to meet together um, so for the first swarm cluster that we will set up we will use the token mechanism so that we don't have to set up anything else Okay, so the first thing is to generate our token. So <clears throat> we'll do uh, token equal docker run dash dash rm swam create pipe t token. So this will put the token in this environment variable, but also in this file. So that's the token of my cluster. <coughs> now we need to deploy the Swarm Manager. So the Swarm Manager is conceptually the, the Docker API load balancer. You talk to Swarm, you, 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 you do a Docker run, it will pick one of the nodes to start the container. When you do Docker PS, it aggregates everything. So, um, I'm going to explain what this super long command stands for. Um, so this is doing docker machine create dash dash driver generic. So use the generic driver. Generic SSH user is docker, so you use the docker user to connect to the machine. Generic IP address is the IP address. So this is the IP address of my node one. Node one here is the name I want to give this machine. Then dash dash swarm means this will be a member of a swarm cluster. 
Swarm Master means it will have a manager running. And Swarm Discovery means use the following discovery mechanism, token, colon, slash, slash, my token. So this will basically connect over SSH to this machine, which is the local machine, and it will do a little bit of auto detection. Let's do it. Do OK. Um, detecting provisioner, provisioning with Ubuntu with systemd. So it's going to make sure that Docker is installed. It's going to update the Docker configuration to add all those flags. It's going to, as you can see here, creating CA, creating client certs. It's going to draw the certificates in the right place. Then <coughs> Docker, configuring Swarm. <coughs> and that's it. So now, if I do Docker machine ls, I see that I have um, node 1 <coughs> using the generic driver, and it has Swarm. If I do Docker ps, <coughs> I see that I have a couple of containers here. I have um, so <coughs> Swarm agent and Swarm agent master. And, um, <coughs> so Swarm agent is doing Swarm join. So Swarm join looks like it's fancy, but no, it's, it's just uh, registering itself like every 20 seconds. It's staying to the discovery mechanism. I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. And then um, the Swarm manager here is connecting to that, getting the list of the machines. <coughs> um, one more about redundancy. At this point, with the setup that we've done here, um, the manager is a single point of failure. So if we lose the manager, we can't control the cluster anymore, but we can still control individual nodes. So if we want to, we can still point the Docker API to one of the machines, and, and, and use directly Docker comments here. And, you can, and, and the manager in this scenario is stateless. So if you lose the manager, that's fine. You can just start another one and resume operations. Uh, later, we'll see how to set up uh, high availability on the manager. So now, um, we will use Docker machine to talk to, uh, to this node. So I'm going to do Docker, if I do Docker machine env node one, it means print the environment variables that I need to use to connect this machine. So it prints me a, a bunch of, you know, so Docker host, remember that one, but then we have a few extra others like Docker TLS verify, Docker cert path, so it tells which certificates should be used to talk to that node. So I'm going to eval that, so now I can do Docker PS, Docker info, Right, Docker version. So far, so good. It's exactly like what we had before. <coughs> now we're going to talk to the cluster. It's a one node cluster, so it's pretty boring at this point, but it's a start. So I'm going to do Docker machine and node one dash dash swarm. And it's almost the same output here, but with a slightly different endpoint. So when I do that, eval docker machine and node one swarm, it means now I want to talk to the swarm controller. Now if I do docker version, the client, that's still my docker binary, so 1101, now the server says I'm swarm 112. So now I'm talking to swarm, which was released yesterday, 112. I didn't even know there was a swarm point release. <coughs> Okay, so now if I do docker info, the output is also pretty interesting because instead of telling me I'm engine and this is my configuration and everything, um, I have specific <coughs> information and here it tells me I have one node and this is the, in the information specific to that node. We will add more nodes and then this output will become more interesting. Right, so output of Docker version, <coughs> Docker info. If I do Docker PS on the Swarm cluster, I don't see any container. Even the Swarm agent and Swarm agent master containers are hidden. However, they are still here. If I do Docker PS dash A, I will see them. Yeah, there. Okay. 
All right, so let's add some nodes to the cluster. And we will use the same um, Docker machine command, except this time we don't need to put dash dash swap master. But otherwise, it's the same story. Uh, there is a little snippet here that we can use to automate that. I'm going to copy paste it into my terminal and explain what it does. So, it's um, the, the node 1, node 2, 3, 4, 5 aliases are in slash etc slash host. So, grep node, this means grep all the entries in slash etc slash host so that we can get the correspondence between name and IP address. Then, uh, grep v127, it's to remove the localhost alias on the current node. We assign that to IP address and node name, and then we execute the machine, create, driver, generic, we still use the token um, service screen mechanism, pass the parameters here. So this will provision the four other nodes and put them into the cluster. <coughs> so, um, Is there an easy way to, uh, to, <laughs> to remove nodes or to, uh, to start at the beginning with a master? <laughs> okay, so yeah, if, if, if we want to remove a node because we did something wrong, uh -huh. we just have to do docker machine, rm, and the name of the node. Okay. It will ask you, are you sure? And then you can do yes. Yeah, with the generic driver, when you remove, it just removes the information. If this were like a, an EC2 instance created with machine, then it would remove it for real but with the generic driver, it's, it doesn't do anything special. All right, not four. For example, when you do uh, the machine create, <coughs> or when you have, say, I have this laptop and I want to connect to or create the docker machine on another one, and then you are your laptop and you want to connect to the docker machine on that, it doesn't really work because Right. The, when we do Docker machine create, we create certificates, and those certificates end up locally only. In that case, the certificates are on node one. So if I lose node one, I'm in a bad situation. So um, <coughs> there are a few things that we are working on. That um, we are working on storing that the information possibly into the key value store because. In the beginning, we did not want to have a hard dependency on the key value store because in the beginning, many things could work without the key value store, but the more you move forward to highly available setups, the more you need a key value store anyway. So we are thinking about using the key value store for machine formation. One thing I want to experiment uh, is to use ConsoleFS, which is a fuse-based uh, file system to put files into console. And so the idea would be we start this cluster, then we start console, then we mount console.fs, and then we move the credentials into console.fs so we can access them from the rest of the cluster. Uh, for now, it's just on the conceptual stage, but that, that should work. Did you think about the cases when, for example, uh, working admin or a developer uh, works with a swarm cluster, let's say, and works uh, <coughs> with the, uh, from the bottom machine? And he doesn't have a Docker installed, a Docker machine installed in his machine, uh, but, but because he has boot to Docker uh, something something, mm -hmm. and uh, how in that case he will reuse the Swarm cluster within right. the development data center? If, yeah, if I have a developer and the, 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 the she or he needs to connect to the cluster, uh, how does that happen? So um, <coughs> uh, there are multiple things depending, I think it depends kind of the, the size of the organization. Uh, if it's a small organization, what I would do is, okay, let's have a, a bastion host, so a host, and we SSH into that host, and from that host we control the rest. If we are a bigger organization, uh, it's all TLS certificates, so then uh, we can generate our own TLS certificates and have developers have their own certificates, um, and I I'm not, um, I don't know really <coughs> how the machine TLS certificate process generation works, 
but I'm pretty sure that you can drop an intermediate CA for machine to use and so that when machine creates the machines, uh, it will generate certificates signed by the machine's intermediate CA. So that, that gives you a way so that machine can automatically generate the certificates for the other nodes without having the root CA inside of machine. But the, for, for small teams, the easiest way is, okay, this is like a micro instance and you just switch to it and that's the that's easiest for now. Okay. Okay, so now if I do Docker info, it gets more interesting. So I, I zoom out, so it's impossible to read, but you can just see the shape. It's like one, not one, not two, not three, not four, not five. So now in Docker info, in the strong cluster, I can see my, the, the health of my whole cluster. Okay, so now... Um, <coughs> Is there any... Are you running that on a specific node? Because if I do that on node one, it just, I don't know, it just shows node one. So, sure, you have to do this command, like eval docker machine and node one dash dash swarm. Oh, you have to be in the swarm container. Yeah, Got it. no, okay. in, um, that's the part I missed. I am still on the machine, but this command means switch my API endpoints to the Swamp cluster. Yeah, it doesn't matter that there's loose containers uh, flying around from previously. Oh, yeah. outside the cluster. Right, that's totally fine, loose. yeah. S swarm in, in this deployment method is stateless, so it's like the manager connects to the host and says, oh, we have a bunch of containers, okay, that's fine. And that's it. What was the last command? Can you show it again? <coughs> last command. Um, so that was. Uh, <coughs> can you show all the. Uh, to show all the. <coughs> yeah. Okay. 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 So now I can do, for instance, uh, let's see, it's a. Uh, can I. has IP, I think. Mm -hmm. nope, slash Ooh. this. Yeah, that's. So for instance, I can do docker run, alpine, something like that. No. Uh, alpine doesn't have curl, so Ubuntu maybe. Mm. Neither. I want something that has curl pre-installed. Uh, CentOS maybe. Um, really? You don't have curl? WGET then? Yes. Get dash o dash. Uh, can I has ip.com slash s? Uh, that's not really convincing. <coughs> okay, well, let's do that the old way. So I'm going to start a few containers like docker run dash d p nginx. So you can see sometimes it's slow, sometimes it's fast, and soon it will be fast all the time, because it's just pulling the Nginx image, and what's in pull on all the machines, we're good. <coughs> so let's uh, zoom a little bit. <coughs> um, so <coughs> now when I do Docker PS, and I, I know it's tiny, but I'm, you, you can see that uh, on your machine as well. I have a bunch of Nginx containers, and now in ports, here, instead of just seeing port numbers, I also see the IP address. And now in the names, I can see on which node it's running, because the name, instead of just being um, stoic mayor, agitated wing, and so on and so on, it's not x slash the container name. So, at this point, it really looks like I have one big machine and I can run containers on it. And now I can either stop all those things. Good. So a word about scheduling strategies. When we did the Docker info, It shows, uh, yeah, it's on the very top, you see like strategy, spread. Um, 
This is the plasma strategy used by Swarm when it has to schedule a container. So random means just pick a node at random. It will still honor resource constraints. So for instance, if I if I if I'm using the random placement yeah. strategy and I start a container with a one gig RAM allocation, it won't put it to the machine that doesn't have at least one gig of free RAM. Yeah. Spread means that it will place the container on the machine that has the, the least containers, but one in <coughs> includes stopped containers. Um, and then bin pack is the opposite. It tries to maximize resource usage. So basically, when you start a container, it tries to put it on the machine, which is already the most full, so to speak. So what is the point of those spread and bin pack strategies? At first, you could think, well, I want my containers to be on different machines, so I won't spread, because that would be more logical. No, that, that's actually not logical at all. If you want your containers to be on different machines, you want to make that explicit. You want to have some constraint. You want to say, I want those containers to be on different machines because high availability. You don't want to have the scheduler maybe put that on different machines because it's trying to. No, you want to put a strict constraint on that. Bin pack <coughs> makes a lot of sense when you are using auto scaling and you want to be able to shut down machines if they are not in use. If you're using spread, you're putting containers everywhere. So if you want to shut down a machine, you have to move containers first. If you're using bin pack, it means that you're trying to fill the first machine, then the second one, then the third one, and so on and so on. And so the other machines remain empty, so if you want to shut them down, you can do that easily. This all assumes uh, static resource allocation, right? It this do it dynamically. So if, if one node, if the <coughs> container uses like, uh, is unbound and uses all the CPU, it doesn't uh, take that into account. Um, so yeah, this, those, um, the, the resource limits are only used if you, if you, if you mention them. Like if, when I do a Docker run Nginx, mm -hmm. um, Docker doesn't know what will be the resource used of that container. Mm -hmm. I have to do Docker run dash M, one gig, dash C, two right. CPUs, mm -hmm. Nginx, and then it knows, oh, okay. Or or if you don't specify dash M, then... <coughs> it counts as zero, which which is fake, but... <laughs> so then it, so the bin pack will just keep on filling one machine? Um, yes. That's what it should be doing, yeah. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> So for instance, if I do, well, my machines have, yeah, three point something gigs of RAM. So I could do docker run, dash dp, dash m, three, three, three gigs, nginx. One, two, three, four, five. And then on the sixth one, it says no resource available to schedule container. But if I remove the memory limit, it's just fine. So. <laughs> Okay, uh, again, this is a deliberate choice because in many scenarios you want to give the, your, your resource specifications, but sometimes you just don't want to and you have no idea, and in that case, well, don't specify it. Is it possible to bring your own scheduler? Is it possible to have more than one scheduler? Um, <coughs> bring your own. Oh, bring your own scheduler? Not yet. But that's something we want to do, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, they are, I mean, there is a, I don't know exactly how it works, but there is a kind of plugging bridge weird thing that is used in particular for the Mesos integration. And that basically lets you have, I mean, you have a, a swarm manager, but instead of directly using resources, it will talk to the Mesos master and ask for resources and then use the resources. I have no idea how it works, but um, in that case, the scheduling is kind of half of the job is done by Mesos and half of the job by Swarm. Mm. Uh, respect to the question, I think someone else asked it. Oh, <coughs> provisioning priorities? 
provisioning priorities. Um, so there is there is no preemptive thing at this point. So for instance, uh, yeah, preempting would be like I'm starting this big job of the cluster, and then there is a more important job, and this more important job needs to evict the old job. Um, so Swarm doesn't do that at this point. Um, well. There hasn't been much request for that yet, but it, the um, so we want to go to this bring your scheduler model where you could plug the scheduler, and then we would be able to do that because then when doing the scheduling decision, instead of just seeing available resources, we we'll also see the existing resources and have some context about what they stand for. Thank you. Okay, so first. Um, <coughs> We will run this to remove the old Docker coins images. Because right now, I mean, if we do, if I go to Docker coins and I do a Docker compose build, it's too easy because everything has already been built everywhere. So I want to clean up the Docker con images first to make a good example for the, for the rest. Right, so I just removed all the Docker coin images. And now I'm going to the Docker Compose build. Did you remove them using in the environment swarm or just on node one? I did that with the swarm environment. In the swarm environment, okay. <coughs> and in that case when you when you remove an image by name. It will remove um, that image name from all the nodes. Yeah. Uh, you have to switch. The, if you want to kill the the ones that were still running, you know, from the previous experiment, you have to switch the out of the swarms in the local one uh, and then kill them. No, that, that's okay. You can stay on swarm, and normally from swarm you should be able to see all the containers, <coughs> so you should be able to remove them all from there. Yeah, with minus A. Um, well, be careful with dash A because you could end up killing the swamp containers. <laughs> but that you don't normally you don't have to. Um, yeah, you should be able to just use the little thing that was there. It was not working. Because some containers were still running, or yes. Okay. Um, and rme f didn't kill them? Um, well, it killed something I'm trying to figure out what was. <laughs> <laughs> and then create Right, so. <coughs> yeah. Here, it says try to start the application and if it works, scale and see what happens. So, why is this written like that? Because. Because yeah. it doesn't work. <laughs> because, well. Because one of those two things won't work. Either this will not work, and if it does, then this will not. So why, what's going on here? When we build the application, we build only on one node. So <clears throat> either all the, um, all the images are built on the same node, and then when we do Docker Compose up, it works. But then when we scale, all the, um, all the scaled containers end up on the same machine. Or when we build, we have one image here, one image here, one image here, and when we try to bring up the application, it doesn't. So, <clears throat> first, um, when we build, that's that slide. Um, <coughs> yeah, the first thing is that. When, when we start the containers, we can only start them at the place where they have been built. So to work around that, we are going to use a registry. So we're going to build on one node, like everything cleanly on one node, and then push to the Docker Hub. And then from the other nodes, we will be able to pull that from the Docker Hub. Then the other thing is that you can have inconsistent versions. Like imagine that you are um, building on the whole cluster, and then you lose a few nodes, you're building a new version, and then the nodes come back, well, now you have different versions. 
So that's also a problem. So when we will build and distribute, we will need to take that into account. So why can't Swarm do this automatically? Well, <clears throat> what do we want to happen when we do Docker build? Either we build on one machine, but then we can only run on this machine, or we build everywhere, but if we have a 1,000 nodes cluster, when you build, you build on 1,000 machines simultaneously, and that's probably not a good idea. And after the build, if I do Docker run, do I want to run on the machine that has the image, or do I want to run everywhere? Uh, if I do Docker pull an image, what should happen? Should it pull it everywhere, only on the machine we already? So, there are lots of things that are simple and straightforward and easy when you have one node, but when you have a cluster, the answer is not really clear. So people are like, hey, maybe Compose could take care of this for us. It all boils down to same defaults. Um, the problem with same defaults is that it depends of your definition of same. Um, so for instance, if Swarm automatically picks a node to build, how should it pick the node? Like what if it takes the node that happens to be running your production database and then the I.O. starts to really suck? What if you actually want to build across multiple nodes so that it's faster? Uh, maybe you want to tag some nodes because you, you can tag engines so you could say, okay, those nodes are only for builds, but then you would have to set that up somewhere in Compose and Swarm. And if no node is available, then um, what will happen? Should it just build on other nodes or should it give you an error? Um, every single deployment, will, every single ops person will give you different answers for that. Some people will tell you no. If, if, if there is no builder available, just abort and give an error. Some people will tell you no. The build has to work, so in that case you fall back to other nodes. Um, <clears throat> now, the, the thing that we will do is that we will build on a node, we will push on the hub, and there again, like, couldn't we automatically push on the hub? Mm, yeah, we could, but it requires Docker Hub credentials. Uh, some people don't want to create an account on the hub. Some people don't want to use the hub. Some people can't use the hub because their machines can't connect to the outside network. Um, so there is, no, th there is no default solution that would be uh, good for everyone. So the plan, <coughs> we will we will decide to pick one node and build everything on this node. You can run your local. Uh, yeah, you can run a, a local registry if you want to, yeah? That's yeah. another option. But again, if you run a local <coughs> registry, um, by default it will use the local file system, so it won't be highly available. So you can use a distributed file system, but then you need to set up Ceph cluster or something like that, or you can use an object store. But if you're running in-house, then you need to set up Swift. So there, there is a depending on the environment, there are many options that would work great. But there is no single option that would work everywhere for everybody in, in every scenario. So what I want to do is build on one node, tag the images, upload them to the hub. So that's where you need the Docker Hub account, and then we will change the compost file so that in the compost file, each time we have build from this directory, instead we will have image, use this image from the hub. And this is automated with the build tag push script. So um, here I need my Docker account, so export Docker. So is this again inside the swarm? I have a hard time seeing when you're in inside the variable swarm or the environment swarm sure. or if you're native on the node. So at this point for now the commands that I'm doing don't really matter, but when I will specifically talk to one or the other, I will I will emphasize it so that it's more clear. Okay, so when you set this environment variable, it doesn't matter if you right. it, it's available for the entire yeah. hosting. Okay. Yeah. Then I do Docker login. Um, and that's maybe, let's see. So here I'm going to concentrate on one node. So I'm going to do Docker machine and node one. Eval that. So I'm talking to node one. Now I'm doing 
<coughs> Docker login. So I'm putting my Docker Hub credentials. <coughs> And now, um, <coughs> so I'm still talking to one single node. I'm using node one on my build node, and that's where I'm running the. So it's build tag push script. <coughs> so it's doing Docker compose build, and then it's tagging. So for instance, um, the yeah. RNG service. It will be jpetazo slash dockercoins underscore rng. The hasher service will be jpetazo slash dockercoins underscore hasher. And they will be tagged with a timestamp. You will see that as soon as it's done pushing, uh, it will generate the new compose file showing that. So I want to take this opportunity, um, since you see that the push is slow because the images are big, to say that we are uh, working on switching the official language images from Debian to Alpine, uh, because Alpine is way, way, way smaller. This will be a slow process, um, because many people are using, well, like me here, from Python, from Ruby, from Node, so we don't want to break everything for all those people. Um, but eventually, those images will switch to Alpine and be way smaller than what they are right now. How do you handle Sorry? How do I handle? How um, that's an excellent question. Um, I I haven't seen it be a problem so far, but it, yeah, you're right. It, there should be some things, but let me check. Like, uh, why did it take months, months done? Actually, it has lost. Yeah. yeah, that's why it's me on. Hmm. Um, Yeah, and I, I don't know. Um, <coughs> I suppose it must be a problem for some things that depend on some specific features of the GLPC, but so far I haven't had problems. Still pushing. <coughs> um, so if you get that, try to docker login again and, and try again. Um, we've got that a couple of times. Also make sure that you are on node one. Like that you that you're talking to a single node and not to the whole form cluster.
system uncompressed. I th maybe the one shown in the Docker Hub is the size of the compressed layers. I will, I will check. So everybody is pushing images? Yeah. Okay. No. No. <laughs> it's still seeing like uh, the authentication problem. Uh, yes. I'm trying to decrease the amount of data. Try to move the entire swarm. Try to do it as a node too. What to do? So <laughs> 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 Yeah, you get it, and then you can just uh, uh, I don't try to So, there is a Thank you. 
So it's pushing everywhere or it's pushed? It's pushed. No such image. What? It's getting up. <coughs> Somewhere. That's not good. No such image. <coughs> probably supposed to run into that, huh? It won't work. It won't work. See, I was doing this, and then I saw this, it won't work, which is like no such thing. Oh, okay, sure. Great, great, So when you log in, there's something. So the YAML file is there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the it's successfully in there. Yeah, the pen and I did that. Yeah, I was the thing. Oh, we got uh, random tracer messages and it's a random process. Yeah. Oh, small, yes. Is it already system 8? So, and then just stop it. Right, that's kind of expected if you are. Um, are you talking to a single node right now? I'm in the swarm right now. So what shows the PS? Okay, I'm in the swarm. And okay. So and um, by grab dot coin. What? Oh, hang on. What? Behind it? The same command, yeah. yeah. By grab dot coin. Well, that's fine. Well, I'm pretty sure I'll do some weird one. Okay, then uh, uh, by... Uh, I can't uh, talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 No, 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 no. I, I mean, grab dot coin, yeah. then... Yeah. Opening embrace. Hang on, this is. Now we get into the language barrier. Yeah, of weird symbols. So this will be the ID of all the containers which are missing on the point. Right? And then. Remove them. <laughs> and now try to put up again. I don't able to find the note that satisfies me. Yeah, not yeah. that yeah. slow yeah. story. Yeah. Dependency is not yeah. Okay, that's good. Yeah, that's good. Okay. So, uh, so I see that a bunch of people reach the, the next step, which is okay. So, I've pushed my images. So now, let's look at this compose file first. 
the, the one that has been generated by the build pack push script. Um, so all the builds now reference images. So like image from the Docker Hub and also have a bunch of like log options, but that's okay. Um, RNG references an image. Everything references an image. So now I use Docker Machine to say I want to talk to my swarm cluster. So Docker Machine and node one dash dash swarm. <coughs> All right. So that's my swarm cluster. Nothing running on it. Docker compose up dash d. And right. Let me just remove the other containers and do it again. And there I will see, so what it's doing now is it's pulling those images from the hub. And then this error here has a perfectly good justification. So that's the thing that we wanted to reach. So what's going on here? Um, Imagine that I just have a really simple app. So I have like a web front end and a database. So Compose is smart enough to know, okay, so you have a link between the web front end and the database. So I need to start the database first and then the web front end. So if we talk to Swarm, that means, hey, Swarm, start the database. Okay, Swarm will put the database wherever. And then we start the, the web front end. And since there is a link between both, Swarm will place them together so that they can be linked and then everything is fine. However, if I have two dependencies, like here I have Walker that needs to connect to RNG and Hasher and also Redis. In that case, um, Compose is still smart enough to um, start the containers in the right order, so RNG, Hasher, RNG, uh, RNG, Hasher, Redis, and then Walker. But when, <coughs> when Swarm receives those information, it say, okay, I'm going to put RNG here, uh, Hasher here, and Redis over there. And then when it receives the Walker, the Walker has to be with RNG, but also with Hasher, and also with Redis. And so it's impossible, because they are on different machines. So that's what it means here. I'm able to find a node fulfilling all dependencies. So, link Docker coin hasher, and also link Docker coin radius, and also link Docker coin RNG. It's pretty verbose, but that's what it means. So, what should we do? Um, <coughs> we could put placement constraints, like we asked the question earlier can we tell Swarm? I want those containers to be together or not together or in this rack. Yeah, we could do that, but in that case, that wouldn't be very helpful because if we tell to Swarm put everything on a single machine, we're back to square one. So instead, um, we will see how to connect containers together. So first, two methods that we will not use. <coughs> um, using server discovery in the application, so that means changing the code, so that instead of having a link, it will uh, query Zookeeper or whatever to know where the other service is running and connect there. But we don't want to change the code, so we don't we won't want to do that. Then we could use environment variables. It's slightly better. So basically, we still change the code, but in the code, instead of saying connect to Redis, we say connect to and Redis host and and Redis port and then we inject those variables into the containers. That's slightly better, but that's still not what we want to do. <sighs> then the two methods that we want to use, the first one will be ambassadors, the other one will be overlay networks. So ambassadors, we already used that before for Redis, but here we will generalize the concept. So each time we have a dependency, like when Walker needs to connect to RNG and Hasher and Redis, we replace the RNG and Hasher and Redis with um, ambassadors that will connect to the actual container. 
And overlay networks is the other option that we may see after, where we just um, bring up all the containers on a single network so they can contact each other directly. And, 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 and that way, so that the, the difference between the two techniques is that with ambassadors, you can provide load balancing and failover because you can do whatever you want, uh, but you require additional containers. With overlay networks, you don't need extra services and containers, but it doesn't provide load balancing and failover yet. It's something that we're working on. So with the ambassadors, the technique that we're going to use is that um, we will remove the links, we will put the ambassadors instead, and basically we will start all the containers, so they will be all disconnected, so they will just start, but if they try to connect to each other, they will have that connection refused. Then we do a second round where we start the ambassadors, and then a third round when we inject the configuration in the ambassadors. Oh. That's, that's simpler than it sounds. Sure. <coughs> so, we will continue to use the HMBA thing of before, because in fact it has dynamic reconfiguration abilities, and when you want to reconfigure it, all you have to do is to start a new container with volumes from and pass the reconfigure option. In other words, let's say I start um, this ambassador called EMBA, so at, at this point it starts without the configuration. I will, I will demo that, it will be simpler. So um, I do docker run dash dash name EMBA dash d jptetzo slash hmba run. Uh, okay, so docker logs, let's see the logs of that. It says initial HA proxy configuration was not provided. You know what, I will just put that in two uh, windows. Uh, let's see, like that, okay. Oops, flow two. All right. And now I'm doing to do docker run dash dash volumes from emba jptetzo slash hmba reconfigure and then I'm going to give the configuration. I want to say listen on port 80 and load balance traffic to 1234 on port 8000 and 4443 on port 4000. Uh, okay. And here it says, okay, I found a new configuration, I'm validating the configuration, I'm starting a proxy, and that's it. And later, if I want to change the configuration again, I say, okay, now I want to listen port 80, but I want to send traffic to google.com uh, on port 80. Um, exactly the same thing. So that's how we reconfigure the, the load balancer. All right, so we have a load balancer that we can reconfigure dynamically pretty easily. That's good. And then we will remove the links uh, and replace the links with extra hosts. So this part is a little bit tricky. Um, <clears throat> the idea, and it's, it's easier once you see the compost file, but to give you the high level overview, each time we have a link, we will replace it by a local DNS entry. So the worker service needs to talk to uh, Hasher, RNG, and Redis. So I will allocate uh, local IP addresses on 127.127.01, 127.127.02, 127.127.03 for those three services. And then I will start the ambassadors running in the same network namespace. <coughs> so from a network point of view, it's as if I had my worker service and it will connect to local, well, not, not exactly local host because local host would be 127.0.0.1, 0, 0, 
but it will connect to 127.127.01 when it wants to talk to Hasher, 127.127.02 when it wants to talk to RNG, and 127.127.03 when it wants to talk to Redis. So it's as if I had all my services running locally. To make a parallel with uh, earlier, I, I talked about the, um, the system they use at Airbnb, it's called SmartStack, and it's pretty similar, except it's just using port numbers. The idea is, you want to connect to MySQL, you connect to localhost 2306. And in fact, on localhost 2306, we have something that knows where the MySQL server is. You want to talk to Redis, you, you connect to localhost 6379. You want to talk to some API, well, we reserved for, I don't know, 8001, 8002, 8003 uh, to talk to the APIs. Here, it's almost the same thing, except instead of allocating port numbers, we allocate IP addresses within the loopback space. Is this also how it's going to be in the future? So, the, um, this is the, the most flexible way in the sense that um, here we're going to use uh, this HR proxy thing which is dynamically set up and if we want to use instead PG pool or if we want to use um, for instance for Redis you can put something that will authenticate to Redis and then pass the connection or you want for instance um, you want to connect to remote service over an untrusted network so you can have on the local on the local theme something that will accept a plain connection encrypted over TLS and then it gets encrypted at the end. So you get lots of flexibility. What we want to do in the long run, and you will see like uh, when once we have overlay networks, is that we don't need this for um, <coughs> sorry you we don't need this systematically. Um, but we can use it if we need custom load balancing. Now, um, the reason why there are like two, two parts, like um, before overlay networks and after overlay networks, is because the part before overlay networks, like all that part also works uh, with the Docker engine 1.6, which is the long-term supported version that we have for commercial support. So when you when you don't want the new features, then this still works. <clears throat> okay, so the only thing that the application has to be careful about is that um, it has to reconnect to the services. Like if, if the application tries to connect and it fails and then it crashes and, and never tries again, then it won't work. So the application has to retry connections, that's the only constraint. So let's see exactly how that works. So first, um, I have a first script, so link to ambassadors, that will here remove all the links and assign the internal loopback addresses instead. Here I had a link to Redis, now I have Redis 127.127.02. Here I had links to Hasher, Redis, and RNG, and now I have 127.127.02, 127.123, 127.123, 127.123, Okay. The next script will be create ambassadors. So, <coughs> uh, do I, I think I need to start the app first. So, docker compose up dash d. <coughs> Right. So now um, the app is up, but all the components are not connected together. So, if, for instance, if I do um, well, um, if I do Docker compose logs, I think it will tell me. Yeah, because it's still using the old. The, the GLF thing that we did earlier, so let me remove that. Mm -hmm. Right. 
Right, so here, Walker is trying to connect. It can't connect yet. It tells me failing. It is trying every 10 seconds. Now, <coughs> I'm creating the ambassadors. So, the create ambassador script will just scan my composable file, say, okay, you have all those dependencies to other services. So, I'm creating the associated ambassadors. And now I'm doing configure ambassadors. So configure ambassadors will collect um, all the running services and the backends, and it will update the ambassadors configuration using the HMBAC reconfigure um, command that I showed earlier. Okay. And now if I look at the logs of Walker, after 10 seconds of wait, it will try again. And that's it, it's starting, it's running now. So now I can do, for instance, docker compose ps web UI. I want to see where the web UI is running. <coughs> okay. And so now I can scale, so like docker compose scale rng equal 10, walker equal 50, web UI equal 2, hasher equal 3. And so at this point, this doesn't change because I still have my five containers, the five initial containers that are working together, and I have the 50 something other containers that are up, but they are not connected yet. So I'm going to give them ambassadors. And then I'm going to configure the ambassadors. And here it will take a couple of minutes, but we will see the load increase. So now, each time we want to scale up or down, we just do, we, we use docker compose scale and then we rerun the create ambassadors and configure ambassadors and that's it. So, for instance, I don't know, I could do like a, a docker compose. Um, will it, how can I see how many? So there are no hooks you can configure in Docker Compose, like after you <coughs> execute this, so you can automate that? There, there is no like, oh, um, post script or something like yeah. that? <coughs> Not yet. Um, for now this has to be done like that, yeah. Um,
So the next thing that we will do is to go to the other method of getting containers to uh, communicate with each other. So by setting up another <coughs> network. Um, so first, <coughs> we will terminate those containers. So we do docker compose kill. F. Okay. So to enable our networks, um, we need a couple of things. Um, first, we need a key value store, either console or zookeeper or etcd. And then we need to reconfigure Swarm to, tell it to use the key value store. So why do we need the key value store? Because <coughs> the way overlay networks um, work is that 
when there is a packet going from a container to another container on the same machine, that's pretty easy. It's just, okay, that's a local container, it can just bridge the packet and that's it. But if it's a packet that goes to a different machine, then the host has to know where that container is located. And um, if we were in a traditional network, like just like machines and switches, we could just use a broadcast, like that's how ARP works. Like when you try to send a packet to a machine on the local network, you send an ARP broadcast to say, hey, where is machine with IP address 192.168.1.332? Otherwise, it's not an IP address. Um, and the machine receives that broadcast and sends back an ARP reply to say, well, that address is here on this Ethernet address. So if we were on a traditional LAN, we could use that to say to send a, uh, send a broadcast packet to say uh, which machine has container with this IP address. But when you're running on a cloud, you can't send broadcast packets generally. So here we rely on the key value store and what we do is that in the key value store, uh, we keep track of the containers and the hosts where the containers are running and when we need to contact the container we look it up in the key value store but we need to set up a key value store so here we will use console who will look up? Hmm? we will look up oh, we is like the docker engine okay. yeah sorry <coughs> um, so The first thing that we will do is that we will remove all containers. So this little snippet here uh, will destroy all containers on all the, f the five nodes. I'm still steady. <coughs> to remove the configuration information for the five machines, uh, the Docker machine RM. It's because we will reuse the Docker machine to uh, reprovision the Swarm cluster. So this snippet here. Okay. So we need to provide two options to the Docker engine, um, cluster store and cluster advertise. So cluster store indicates um, which key value store we want to use. So that could be console colon slash slash something or zookeeper colon slash slash something, etc. etc. And cluster advertise, um, that's because the, the, the goal is to, in the key value store, to have uh, a mapping that says this container is on this host. But when we say this host, we really mean what's the IP address of the host? How can I contact this host? So it means that when an engine is running a container, it has to record that container in the key value store. And right next to the container, it has to put the IP address of itself, like the, the host on which the container is running. So for that, we need to tell the engine, what is the IP address by which it can be contacted by the other machines. So that's the goal of the cluster advertise option. Um, that's particularly important when you are in an environment where machines either have multiple interfaces, so then you, you want to tell which interface uh, you want to use, or when you have NAT. Well, on EC2, for instance, uh, it's often complicated because each instance has two IP addresses. There is the internal IP address and there is the external public IP address. So here for cluster store, 
we will put console colon slash slash localhost colon 8500, which means use the console cluster uh, running locally. And so in the beginning, on localhost 8500, there is nothing, uh, but there will be something later. Um, and then for cluster advertise, we're putting eth0 colon 2376. So this means take the IP address on eth0 uh, and use port 2376, which is the default port of Docker engine. <coughs> So to pass those options to our Docker engines, we're going to use this snippet. So this, the configuration snippets that we use for Docker machines are going to get bigger and bigger. And I'm going to review that. So uh, let's see, I think this should be fine. All right, so we are, reusing, we are reusing the commission to say provision <coughs> swarm node, that should be the swarm manager. Um, and also for the, talk, for the swarm discovery, since we are using console, we are getting rid of the token discovery and we are switching to the console discovery. So we will also use console for swarm cluster discovery. Uh, then we tell to the engine, uh, use console as a key value store, advertise yourself in console using the IP address of ETH0 port 2376 and the others are the generic driver running options. Okay. <coughs> <coughs> I don't, this is on, if I know, log into node one, I don't even have the original external IP anymore. Oh, that's okay, that's normal. That, that's, really? Yeah, that's because on EC2 you have an internal IP address, mm -hmm. and the external IP address mm -hmm. is, uh, you, you don't see it on the instance. So that's normal, don't worry. Oh, okay, so I can still do whatever now, because I lost connection again. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, yeah, well, the, the other thing didn't work anymore. So I had to stop during the directions. Not on yes, not three, yeah. Mm, you can do docker machine, rm not three. Okay, and I'm all clean. Yep. So I should be able to continue. All right, yep. cool, thanks. <coughs> okay. Okay, and for the for the notes, again we'll read the names and IP addresses from PTC host. will be up and running, then we will try to talk to the swarm cluster and see what's happening. <coughs> and I, I'm giving a warning ahead of time, the first time that we will try, it will not work because everything is using console and we haven't started console yet. And the thing is that we will be running console inside Docker. So that's pretty interesting because Docker needs console, but console needs Docker. and it will still work because Docker will not try to talk to console until it is strictly necessary. And if it fails, it will not crash, it will just report an error for that operation and continue. So for instance, if I do um, docker machine and node one dash dash swarm, so I try to speak to my swarm cluster, I do docker ps, 
tells me, okay, I have no containers. I do Docker info. In the output of Docker info, it tells me I have zero node. Yeah, because discovery is not functional yet. But that's okay, it just tells zero node, but everything is fine. Right, so <coughs> now we will run console. Um, so we're going to use a, a, a custom console image, but it's, it's not that custom. It just has a little startup script to make the setup easier. Um, and there, will, there are two other things that we will use to, to make that setup easier. Uh, first, we will tell Docker to automatically restart that container if the container crashes or if the machine reboots, so that we don't have to manually restart console each time. And also, uh, we will tell Docker to start this container in host networking, because console um, uses a gossip protocol to discover neighboring nodes, and so either we, when, when, the, when console is in a container, uh, it only sees the IP address of the container and it doesn't know the IP address of the node. This is um, a feature that also happens with Elasticsearch, Ryak, RabbitMQ, CouchDB, um, Mongo, or all the systems that insist on knowing their own IP address and gossip their IP address uh, to the other nodes. Um, <coughs> the easiest way is to run them in host networking. That way you remove a lot of problems from the equation. But is our underlying VXLAN or... Um, sorry? Is our underlying VXLAN or... Uh, lost? How, how do they find each other and not it to another... Oh, address? so... Um, in the way that we will run them, they will have access to the host interfaces, so they know that their local address will be like the internal EC2 address. So when they will talk to the next node, they will say, hello, I'm this IP address, and this IP address is the right IP address. <coughs> if we were running um, with the container network model, then it would say, my IP address is the, IP, the private IP address in the container, and that IP address is meaningless for the other containers. Yeah. How do they, different hosts, find each other? How do they see each other and not see all the other hosts? Oh, you mean initially, how do they learn about the other nodes? That's the gospel, but how do they prevent <coughs> from seeing other nodes outside the ones you have on your paper? Um, so, it's, it's the other way around. So, when you start a console cluster, um, once you have a cluster, when you add new nodes, you just have to give the address of at least one node, okay. and from that node it will find the others. Okay. So the first node we have to give it dash bootstrap. Um, so the reason why there is this bootstrap flag is because without that you could start two console nodes, and then you say, okay, you, I want to join the other node, and then the, the, the key thing with console is that it's highly available and consistent. So if you have two independent console servers and they, they join, one of them becomes the, the new truth and the other one disappears and that's, that's not possible. So you have to start one server in this bootstrap mode to say you are alone so you should not try to reach a consensus with other servers. You can start immediately and then the other nodes will be started with the join flag. Um, so if we unpack a little bit that command, so docker run, dash dash name, console node one, I'm naming it because it will make it easier to identify it later. Dash D, so run them on nice. Dash dash restart, it can always, so when we restart the engine, console will be restarted too. Dash dash net host, use the jptitle slash console image. Agent, so that, that's the server mode. Dash server, they are actually in the agent mode, there is there are two um, Different, slightly different modes for console. Uh, there is a server that takes part into the consensus and the leader election and everything. And there is like the normal non-server agent that will join, but just be, <coughs> how to say, um, it will listen, but it will not speak. So, 
Why are we starting this from with your you? Do I need to change your user ID to mine, or does it not matter? Uh, that one? Yeah. Oh, um, leave mine here because it, I did a, a small custom console image. Um, <coughs> okay. <coughs> so and I can run this command natively from node one, but still from the directory, the Docker coins directory. That doesn't matter. Oh, uh, yeah. We could even read from another directory. That's fine. We only need to be in the Docker cons directory when we are using Compose to start the Docker cons application. Uh, yeah, we need to talk to the um, directly to the non one. So right. <laughs> Now we need to get the IP address of the node. Yeah. And then we are going to start console on the other nodes. So we just loop with an SSH and it's exactly the same command except instead of bootstrap there is join the node that we started earlier. <laughs> and now, if with a browser, we go <coughs> to the instance IP address on port 8500. Yeah, the five nodes are already up here. When you say instance IP address, that's any of the five node IP address, the 52 yes. dot. <coughs> so a couple of console useful commands. So there is like Docker run, <coughs> dash dash net host, dash dash rm. Chapetazo slash console members, I think. So this gives me the, the view of my console cluster. So it means, okay, five nodes running, everything is fine. And there is a curl localhost 8500 slash v1 slash leader status, I think. <coughs> status leader. That gives me the IP address of the current console leader. Okay, so now console is up. So now when the Docker engines and Docker Swarm are going to try to talk to console, it will work. And so normally now if I do if I point my API again to Swarm and I do docker info Hi. now I see my whole cluster here and if I do docker ps I will see my five console uh, containers so this shows that when you when you start swarm I mean, when, when Swarm starts and you already have containers running, uh, Swarm will see them just fine. And so, of course, if we kill those, we are in trouble because Swarm relies on that to work properly. I mean, we are in partial trouble because we just have to restart them, but nonetheless. Okay, so now we have a functioning uh, cluster. <coughs> and we will use multi-host networking. So, um, since Docker 1.9, there is the concept of networks, and each network is like a private switch, and you can connect containers to that. So, we do a little example of that. I'm, I'm going to create two networks. So, there is something interesting with that whole section here, is that 
if you want, you can run that on a single machine. <coughs> and in that case, you just get local networks. Um, but it works the same way. This means that when you are developing an application, and you want to have multiple networks like front-end, DMZ, back-end, and so on, you can still have multiple networks and check that everything works fine. <coughs> and then when you go to production on a cluster, uh, you have exactly the same concepts. So I'm going to create um, using the overlay driver um, a network called Jedi and another called Darkside. Now if I do Docker network ls, I see all the internal networks of node 1, node 2, 3, 4, 5, and then I see the two global networks that I've created here. Now I'm going to do docker run <coughs> dash d dash dash name luke dash dash net jedi redis and I'm going to put dash m3g so I'm creating a redis container I'm putting it in the Jedi network and I'm putting 3 gigs of RAM. I'm going to put 3 gigs of RAM uh, just to force them to be on different hosts, just to see that the communication really happens across multiple hosts. Okay, um, now I want to create a container called Vador, also connected to the Jedi network. And now I can do docker exec um, vador ping luke. So now from the vador container I can ping the luke container. Okay. So now I'm going to create a container in the dark side network. Let's call it Sidious and dash dash net dark side uh, yeah. Nginx. Okay. So now if I try to do like from Vador ping Sidious, that doesn't work because they are not on the same networks. However, I can connect Docker network connect dark side Vador. And now Vador can ping Sidious. It can still ping Luke. Yeah. But I can also dynamically disconnect. So I can do Docker network disconnect. Uh, Jedi Vador and now Vador can't ping Luke anymore <coughs> and if I do docker ps I see that my three containers are on three different nodes what kind of oh, container is this? What is sorry? Oh, what kind of overlay network? So under the hood, it's using, it's using VXLAN. Um, so when we, when we do Docker network create, it will allocate a VXLAN ID and also allocate uh, a subnet, uh, and it will make sure that they are uh, that they don't overlap. Um, and then when we connect a container to a network, uh, it's just like adds dynamically an interface to the container. And yeah, that's what you mentioned. <laughs> well, it allocates an IP address for that container in the subnet, then creates the interface and connects the interface to the container. What, what kernel do uh, I mean of the kernel version? Do you mean? So, <coughs> with engine 110, so the latest version, you just need to have kernel 3.10 or above. However, in, in, in the previous version, in engine 19, uh, you needed the more recent kernel, 316. <coughs> so you don't need any of the VXLAN properties in the 
Terminal. No, you don't need kernel 4.x for that to work. And so under the hood, on the on the network, the VXLAN packets are plain unicast UDP packets, so they can traverse any network equipment, any router, any anything. There, there is nothing special. The, the only drawback of the XLAN is that there is a capsulation, so you have a little bit of extra padding in the packets, <coughs> but that's what you mentioned. Okay. So the, the whole networking is done outside the kernel? It's done in the Docker engine, in, in user mode? Um, no, it's in the kernel, but the XLAN is in the kernel since like three, uh, two, three, four, something oh, like okay. that. It's been there for a while, yeah. <coughs> I think what is new is uh, maybe that, that I think there are some hardware that supposedly <coughs> accelerates encapsulation and the encapsulation, mm -hmm. but I, I I don't know exactly how that could really. I mean, it's like VLAN acceleration. It was a thing in the '90s, but uh, hardware acceleration of removing four bytes in front of a packet doesn't really make sense now. So, so just. So I get it. We have two networks, Darkseid and Jedi, mm -hmm. and we connected the two containers first to Jedi, and mm -hmm. then the container, oh, but the was part of Darkseid, they couldn't talk. Yep. And then with the one command, we basically said connect the um, connect the container Valor also to Darkseid. Exactly. That basically allowed. So Vador is now connected to Darkseid and Jedi. Yes. It's connected to both, but the original loop is still connected to only one. Yes. And so to maybe... So where do you track who now is connected to who? Because after a week of doing connect and disconnect Absolutely. Events, how do you now know Absolutely. who talks to who? So first I will show one thing, like how exactly does it materialize inside the containers? So here I have reconnected Vador to the Jedi network, and if I do docker exec Vador uh, <coughs> ifconfig, maybe? No, I don't have ifconfig, so ip, edit there, ls, yes. I can see that in this container, I have um, those two interfaces <coughs> here correspond to my two extra networks. <coughs> and I can do stuff like docker network inspect <coughs> Jedi <coughs> and it tells me this network is using the overlay driver it's using this subnet this is the default gateway and those are the containers connected to this network Luke and Vador using this and this address and so if I disconnect Vador and I do a docker inspect again. I need to give it... Uh, wait, it's still shown here. <coughs> I think... Yeah, I think it persists the IP address. If I want to see exactly which network is connected to, it will be in Docker Inspect Battle. Um, yeah, that's it. Conversely, if I connect it, and now I do an inspect, in the network section, here I have both Downside and Jedi. D does that answer the question? Yeah, yes, uh, yes, uh, partly. I, I see that this, you now can see it from a network point of view, you can see which containers are connected. Mm -hmm. From a container point of view, you can see to which network it is connected. <coughs> and then I think the default policy is that once you're connected to a network, you're allowed to speak to all containers Absolutely. that are part of that network. Yes, yeah. Is this all done through namespaces at the lower end, or is it? Um, so, 
at the low level, each container gets its network namespace. So it means that now if, if I start something using dash dash net container, um, then the new container will have the same networks because it's in the same network namespace. Oh. We basically move namespace, you have to move the containers into the right namespace. Um, or assign the namespace to the containers. Yeah, so just to <coughs> make it clear, um, this Vador container, which is connected to two networks at the same time, it's still one network namespace. It's its own network namespace. There is like one network namespace per container, except when you explicitly decide to share them okay. with the dash dash net container option. That means, okay. Oh. So now we um, yeah, what if I want to have more than 256 containers on a given network? Well, in that <coughs> case, what I can do is docker network uh, create dash dash driver overlay dash dash help because I don't remember the option dash dash IP range, I think, and then I put no dash dash subnet. Uh, 10.42.0.0/20, and I call that like big party, and then uh, <coughs> thank you. Now I have an, a, um, a network on which I can put more containers. And by the way, there is a, a, a couple of interesting options here. If I had a machine with a public IP network, uh, I mean a, a public subnet, I could use that subnet here. And then there is a dash dash IP option when you run a container. So you can force the IP address of a container to use, I mean, you can force a container to use a specific IP address. Mm. And so you can put containers on a public subnet and put them with a fixed address, which is something that people wanted for a very long time. All right, so now I'm going to clean up all those networks. subnet of public IP addresses here, I could do like uh, something like docker network create dash dash subnet 150 whatever subnet I have, which tells to docker uh, create a network and on this network use those IP addresses and then I can create a container and tell the container to use this subnet and in that case docker will give uh, addresses within its subnet. But I can also do docker run dash dash ip to force the container to a specific address. Let me, I, I, will, I will demo that. Like, I can do uh, docker network create, so driver overlay dash dash subnet, uh, I don't know, one zero 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 slash mm, 24. Uh, what did I forget? Yeah, the name, uh, public. And then I can do like docker run <coughs> dash dash net public dash dash ip 10042 um, image, let's say, nginx. And that's it. And now if I do docker inspect nginx, where is the IP address? Somewhere. Oh, no, right, sorry. I have to give the ID of the container. So, docker inspect 
this container, it's on IP address 10042. <coughs> Um, so to make it accessible, it's when you create the, um, the, the network, you have to specify the gateway and I think that's all you have to do. Um, I haven't experimented with that since I don't have servers that have some nets like that, but uh, let me... I know that Jessica from the core team blogged about it. Uh, come on. DNS is being slow. Yeah. Any day now. <laughs> Yeah, just talk on it will create the gateway. And that's pretty much it. Mm. Alright. Um, how did I call it again? Public. Yeah, there are still some things in the docker network command that have to be improved. Like for instance, right now if you do docker network rn, but there is still a, a containers on this, we refuse to remove the network. So eventually I think we will have docker network rm-f that just disconnects all the containers from the network and removes the network. Uh, one last little detail uh, is that um, there is also a kind of auxiliary network so that even if you disconnect the container from all the networks it still has outgoing network access uh, because it has an extra interface on the default auxiliary bridge so that specifically for the case when you disconnect all the networks of the container because you're like okay you don't have access to all those things the containers can still access the outside network through a kind of default gateway by default and I don't know how to disable it. I know it's possible, but I don't know how. All right, so we have a volley networks, but how does that help with Compose? Um, in Compose 1.5, there was the X-networking flag, which means um, create a network for my containers and put them all on this. Um, <coughs> and in Compose 1.6, there is a new Compose file format that has the notion of networks. Uh, Compose is still backward compatible with the old Compose files, but it will automatically switch to the new format when it detects a file with the new format. Um, the new format, so if you have to convert from Compose v1 to Compose v2, uh, it's pretty easy. Um, all the things that were on the top level, you move them under a services uh, section and you put version colon 2 as well. So, for instance, by now I think you recognize this compose file. We have version 2, then services, all the services, and as you can see, we removed all the links from these files. We don't need them anymore because now automatically this will be reachable under the name RNG, this will be reachable under the name Hasher, and so on and so on and so on. So, so what I will do now is I will um, take the compost file we had earlier and convert it to the V2 format. So, just putting that under a services section and then putting version 2 <clears throat> and I'm getting rid of all the extra host and all that stuff 
we don't need anymore. And now I'm going to bring up the application. So you see it says creating network buffer point before the buffer driver. And now I can do docker compose ps. I want to see the web UI address. And I can see that it's running and it's working. So now we have um, if I do doc, docker ps um, I can see that the containers of my app are running on different nodes and if I scale up like if I scale up worker they will end up pretty much anywhere but they will still be able to talk to each other so once we have that it becomes pretty easy to re-add the load balancing mechanism that we had in the beginning. Like when we said, okay, now replace RNG with the load balancer and have re RNG, one, two, three, four. And with that, we don't need the, um, the, the complex ambassador scenario that we did just before. I will demo, so... Um, this is my compost file and I want multiple RNG instances. Okay, so... <coughs> RNG 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And then RNG, image, jpetazo, hmba, command, listen on port 80, and load balance traffic across RNG 1, 2, three, four, and five. Mm -hmm. Now Docker Compose up dash D. One, sorry? It should be H Amba. Oh no. That. That, that one? Yeah. Does it start? Yeah, yeah. I think it's good. So yeah. And the web UI, is it still on the same address or is it a different address? <laughs> no, that's that's it, it's running. <laughs> and now I can scale the walker. If I look where my containers are running, um, so I have like, uh, yeah, they are basically spread all over the place. So the, um, the overall idea here is that um, if we compare like the, the first thing we did with the ambassadors and with the scripts and all that stuff, um, on the one hand, the, the scripts are more complicated because yeah, we have to run those scripts and create extra containers and um, all those things. On the other, here we rely on the console cluster uh, and on the overlay network feature. Um, 
we, we still present both ways, uh, just because, uh, I mean, some people want to run with the stable engine, which means you don't get overlay networks, I mean, stable engine. The, the one that is commercially supported, or the one that is, I don't know exactly what the status now with RHEL, but for a while we, we are not sure if we would have overlay networks on Docker on RHEL, so having the ambassador was a good way to work around the issue. Um, so yeah, it's a, a trade-off when we have both. So to answer your question earlier, like it is going to be so complicated, the answer is as well. That, that way is simpler. Once you have deployed console and set up the overlay network, then scaling becomes way, way, way simpler. <coughs> Right, so we see that. Um, so, other things that are interesting that I don't cover here, but that are good ways to um, experiment with what we have so far, is to see how we deploy a new version. Like, what what are the steps? So it's okay. We need to um, change the code, run, build, tag, and push. We have a new compose <coughs> file. We feed the new compose file. Um, to scale the services and then re-up. Um, an even better method is to use zero downtime deployment with uh, um, blue-green deployment. So you have two stacks and you deploy a new version of the stack. Then you have a load balancer in front of the two stacks and you switch traffic from one to the other. And the nice thing with the HMBA image that I have here is that it gives you a really easy to reconfigure load balancer. When you need something where, okay, now I want to set traffic between this and this, and you want on the fly to change the configuration, this gives you exactly that. And um, I, I don't dive into the, the details, but um, it's really modular in the sense that if you want to give an arbitrary HF proxy configuration, you can. You can have another image that does some extremely fancy thing, like it's um, hooked to a console or to another deployment system, and it generates uh, the new config file for HMBA, and HMBA will happily get that config file and load it. So, um, okay. <coughs> <coughs> All right, so we're reaching the last section. So first thing, let's clean up all those containers once again. So the last section is about the experimental features um, linked to um, <coughs> high availability and rescheduling of containers. So there are two things that we want to have in high availability. The first one is to have Swarm itself being high available so that if we lose the Swarm manager then we can fall back on another Swarm manager. So there is replication in Swarm, and um, it's just doing simple leader election. So it means that any, at any given time, you can have multiple Swarm managers. One of them will be primary. The other ones will be secondary. If you talk to the primary, it just works as before. So the Swarm manager does the, executes the request. If you talk to a secondary, it will transparently forward you to the primary. It's completely transparent, so for the user there is no, nothing special. If the primary goes down, then there is a, the, the, a leader election is triggered and another secondary steps up and becomes the new leader. So the leader election mechanism relies on the key value store, <laughs> once again. So there again you can use console, it's a diesel keeper. Obviously since we deployed console here we will continue to use it. 
Um, one important thing, and that's like a big difference compared to Mesos, for instance, is that you don't need to have a consensus between the swarm managers. This means that if you want, you can have just two swarm managers and it's okay. The leader election doesn't happen between the swarm managers. It's just that swarm managers will use the key value store to perform the leader election. That might seem like, wait, what? But if you look at how Mesos works, when you deploy Mesos, you have the Mesos master, then you have, let's say, uh, Kronos, and then you still need Zookeeper. And you have consensus at each level. So you need a consensus at the, between the different Zookeeper. Then you need a consensus between the Mesos masters, and you need a consensus <coughs> between your Kronos instances. Which means that you need at least people say, well, in theory, three, five Zookeeper nodes, five Mesos master nodes, and five Kronos nodes. And if you have a loss of consensus at one level, it doesn't work anymore. Um, if you read, um, that there is a series of blog posts um, by Kyle Kingsbury called Call Me Maybe, where he tests, um, it does some hardcore network partition and load testing uh, on distributed systems. And the one he did on Kronos was really interesting because it shows that normally when you have a distributed system like that, you, you re everything is on Zookeeper. So if Zookeeper breaks, everything is broken. But the other things should be pretty okay. And here, the situation was not so great because sometimes you had a loss of consensus with Zookeeper, sometimes with Mesos, sometimes with Kronos. So you end up with three times more issues that you should, normally should have. So here, for now, the consensus happens on uh, console, so you, you don't you don't need to put um, many swarm managers if you don't want to. Uh, conversely, it means that if you want to put many swarm managers, it's not a problem because they are not running a consensus, so they're just relying on the console consensus. Um, okay. Yeah, there, um, when I did some uh, stress testing, I found a bug when you when you um, <coughs> trigger a swarm leader election and during the leader election you cause a console cluster leader election then you can end up in a scenario when you don't have a swarm manager anymore and you need to manually break a lock on console but there is an open bug for that so it will be fixed shortly. I have a question, um, if the swarm leader fails and another leader is selected um, do I have to change something in my client because I cannot reach the, the swarm leader anymore? So yeah, if, if, the, if there is a, a, a leader election, do I need to do something in my client? So there are, there are two scenarios. Either I'm talking to a node and that node goes away and then yeah, I need to talk to another node. Or if I'm talking to a node which is, let's say, the secondary and the primary goes away, then I'm not affected. I can, I can continue to do that. So what you can do to be completely like uh, agnostic to whatever is happening is you talk to a simple TCP load balancer that sends to your nodes and that works. How Elasticsearch internally actually does that uh, the clients uh, replicate, retrieve uh, state updates of the cluster and every time the yeah. master changes, uh, the clients know who to talk to master. Yep. So the, the, we. We can't do that, so it's not implemented in the client right now, but as you will see shortly, it's really easy because when you do Docker info, it tells you the address of the other nodes. So the client could, if it wanted to, it could retrieve the list and cache it and use it later. Yeah, the main thing is uh, to make it easy enough because if you try to do HDFS in highly available mode, you need to add 25 uh, new properties to uh, HDFS site.xml and uh, that is not really convenient. Right. So, um, once again, we will use Docker Machine with 56 command line arguments uh, to tell it to provision the cluster. Um, so first, we will clean up the existing cluster information with this little thing. So this will connect on the five nodes, it will destroy the swamp containers, and um, it will remove the information from the Docker Machine registry. Right? <coughs> mm -hmm. 
So then, um, there are good and bad things with that snippet. Well, the bad thing is that, as you can see, it's becoming bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, but the good thing is that now that we are running in uh, redundant mode, we can use the same command for the five nodes. Before we had one managed node and the four other were just normal members. Now all nodes are symmetrical, so we can use one big provisioning command for everything. So again, we are getting the list of IP addresses and nodes from the TC hosts. We're using the generic driver, telling to use Docker as the user. Uh, we are using engine option cluster store and cluster advertise, that's for the overlay network. We're using Swarm, Swarm Master, Swarm Discovery is console. Then we are enabling Swarm Opt application. And we put an advertise option as well for Swarm Opt. That's exactly the same thing. It's like when, when the Swarm node is secondary, it needs to know how to contact the primary to send the command. So that's why we need an advertise option for Swarm as well. Do we need to remove the environment variables? Do we need to remove the, sorry? Environment? The Docker environment, the Compose environment? Um, what, what do you mean? Environment variables. Oh, the variables? No, we, we, it doesn't matter. Okay. But you have to leave a uh, swarm mode, like put your Docker on the single node, or yeah. Yeah. to stay in the, in the swarm? Uh, like the eval, blah, 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 and the Oh, uh, that doesn't matter at this point. Doesn't matter. Yeah. and swarm agent master containers because if we don't remove them a uh, machine will try to create them and since they already exist we'll get an error By the way, if we do a um, Docker PS, so let's see, I'm going to switch the machine and node one. I see that console is still running. Um, <coughs> because it, it, it was with the restart policy, so when the machine provisioned the engine, it restarted the engine, and then the engine automatically restarted console. Right, so let's see, docker run, dash dash rm, dash dash net host, <coughs> console members. All right, my, my console cluster is up. Um, now I'm going to point my uh, environment to the swarm cluster. So docker machine and node one dash dash swarm. Mm -hmm. No elected primary cluster manager. So what's going on here? Um, <clears throat>
So in that case, so that's the that's the risk condition I was mentioning earlier. So to to fix that, um, what I do is I um, I don't know if that's the best way, but what I do is I, I go to um, any node on port eight five zero zero. So that takes you to the console. Um, that's really big, but uh, that, that's the console UI. Then you go to key value, <coughs> Docker. Swarm, leader, and so here there is like a console API lock. So just remember, like the first characters is like two six three blah blah blah. I click here, and then I find it here two six three blah blah blah, and you click on invalidate, and then confirm, and then when you go back to Kiva you. So here, you just like reload a bit and have, well, since it was already there, yep. And, and after doing that, when you, do, when you try again, it should work correctly. This is a known bug and there is someone working on it. Well, maybe not right now because it's 8 in the morning in California right now, but so once again, uh, where do we need to invalidate the, uh, the Docker nodes and then uh, any nodes that hold the AI uh, lock? Yeah, so the, the, it comes from the fact that um, the, the node holding the lock, um, it's still holding the lock, but it, it's not aware that it's holding the lock because it was restarted. So it's like the, the other nodes are like, hey, somebody else is holding the lock, so I, everything seems fine and I shouldn't cause a leader election. But the node holding the lock was restarted. It's still in replica. <coughs> and it's like, well, somebody is holding the lock, so I should not trigger an election, except it's himself holding the lock. So it should just become the primary because it's holding the lock. Sorry, how to invalidate the primary? <coughs> hmm? How to invalidate the primary? So to invalidate, we go to <coughs> here. So uh, it's a Docker. Docker Swarm leader, and here there is a lock session. Uh, we have to note the first characters is like F77 whatever. We click here, and then here we find it like F77 and invalidate. <laughs> Are you also missing node 5 in WPS? So I'm missing 1 and 2 here. Um, oh, yeah, yeah missing even here. Well, I have my 5 nodes in Docker Info. So. <coughs> Yeah, those two should be running, so let's see what's going on. SSH, node 5, docker logs, console, node 5. <coughs> Thank you. 
Okay, let's see if that causes other problem or it's fine. Um, <laughs> so this command will tell us who's the current master. So it tells me I'm not one, I'm a replica, and the primary is that node. Mm -hmm. So now what I'm going to do is fine, let's let's connect to that node and do like a docker kill swarm agent master. Okay. And now if I do docker ps, yep, so that's that's the expected thing. It tells me well I can't reach the master. And so will it trigger an election? Right, it took a while, but that's now we now we're good. Yep, it's up again. <coughs> so we 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 killed the active swarm agent, and it took like a little bit less than one minute, and then the new leader is elected. Again. Yep, and there we go. It took approximately forty seconds. <coughs> My note five is back. Hmm? My note five is back again. I'm sorry? My note five is back again. Uh, yeah, I, I must admit that the console note is being here, there is something a little bit suspicious. Um, <coughs> Alright, so if I do So the, the, the other high availability feature uh, is for containers themselves. So this time is like when a node goes away, um, having the, a container being restarted on another node. Um, so this is super experimental. So first you need to pass a very experimental flag to the thing. So we'll see how to do that. And the other thing is that if a container cannot be rescheduled at a given point, like let's say you have a container that requires 10 gigs of RAM and the machine goes down and there is no other machine that has 10 gigs of RAM, then the container is lost. So this is something that is being worked on as well uh, to basically, um, we, we already store the container information the, the containers that need to be restarted, that's already being stored into the key value store. So the next step is to have a reconciliation loop that, okay, if you can't start the container immediately, then once in a while it tries again, to say, okay, do I have enough resources now to start it, and, and try again. So the, the idea here 
is not to start your whole application with this high availability feature, but to have one container with the high availability feature and have that container have as little uh, constraints as possible. <coughs> that container will be responsible for uh, keeping the rest of the stack up and running. So that will be the functional equivalent of the replication manager in Kubernetes. All right, so, um, yeah, we, I'm using a swarm experimental image for that. Just, so it's not because I did a custom build of swarm, it's just because I need to pass the dash dash experimental flag before any other flag, so I'm using a custom image for that. And then, once again, Wipe out the configuration. Then reprovision. So we started the whole cluster um, with the flag. Uh, yeah. 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 So now, um, docker run, dash d. That's what we need. So when we start the container, we pass the reschedule policy. <laughs> And so that tells to Swarm, persist that container into the key value store, and if it goes down, try to restart it on something else. And I, we might be able to see that container information somewhere. Uh, maybe not. Or maybe it's somewhere else. And now, um, so let's find out on which node it's running. <coughs> so it's running on node 4. So let's make an experiment. SSH node 4, so first docker ps, and I have this nginx container on node 4. And then SSH node 4, sudo <coughs> reboot, and let's see what happens. Not very convincing so far. So docker logs, not <coughs> So it said that it rescheduled the container from node 4 to node 5, but I'm not mm. seeing it on node 5, so... <coughs> hmm, it was created, but not started. I have to say, in my case, uh, it rescheduled two. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the experimental part. Um, <coughs> right. So the um, on the reschedule part, it's it's. Uh, I think I mentioned that this morning, but um, when I did the workshop recently and. I was showing the network part and somebody told me well two months ago that didn't exist, one month ago it kind of worked and today it works. And so here it's kind of the same idea. This is the experimental part. I mean I warned you, I told you okay this part is going to, the machines are going to catch fire and horrible things are going to happen. Um, well it's not horrible, I, I'm just embarrassed because the last demo doesn't work. Um, but the key idea is that this is what we are working on right now. Um, 
the high availability part. Well, there are two parts that are going to change significantly uh, in the next version of Swarm and of the engine. Uh, the um, high availability <coughs> stuff, um, so that this rescheduling works correctly. And the other thing is on the network side, um, today when we do, when we do a Docker Compose scale, if it's a worker, it works fine. We get multiple containers executing the same code and yeah, great. If it's a network service, only one instance is receiving traffic. This is something that we're going to change. Um, there is a big debate in the network team to know what should be done, like should it be a virtual IP and then the result balancing, should it be DNS round robin, should it be something else. I'm personally advocating for having DNS round robin because if you have DNS round robin, first it works out of the box, like if you have some code that is stupid, it just connects to a random IP address and it works, and if your code is smart, it can get all the IP addresses and do client-side um, uh, failover like we were mentioning earlier for Elasticsearch. Um, once we have those two things, like the solid HA and the network <coughs> load balancing, um, we get to the stage where we can take the compost file we had in the beginning and with zero change you just deploy it and then you do Compose scale and that just works. And uh, the what we're trying to do here to kind of uh, look back on what I was kind of explaining that the key differences between how things work in Swarm, how things work in Kubernetes, we are really starting from something that is developer friendly, and we are working really hard to make it ops friendly. Um, on the Kubernetes side, it's exactly the opposite approach. We have something that is currently ops-friendly and that is becoming increasingly <coughs> dev-friendly. Ideally, uh, the, the best scenario, the one where everybody wins, is where we kind of, if we can <coughs> agree of, for instance, using the compost file as a way to define applications. Like if I could do kubectl and give it a compost file, then that's a big win because it doesn't matter for the devs, like devs could use a compost file, it doesn't matter if you decide to use Swarm or Kubernetes because in <coughs> both scenarios you can take this compost file and deploy and scale the application. Um, yeah, that part is to say that yeah, we still have to do some work to deploy our apps, uh, as, at least right now. So for the people, I think it's no longer the case, but a while ago there were people being like, oh my god, with Docker is going to steal my job. No, not quite. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much that this part is not really. Yeah, the, I, I didn't dive into the details of the Python scripts that we use for the ambassador section, but they're rather short, like the link to ambassadors, build tag push, create ambassadors, configure ambassadors. They are like 50 to 60 lines of code. So for information, the scripts that I use to start the VMs for the workshop are bigger than that. <laughs> so, um, And also, I have to mention that we have two commercial products called Docker Cloud and Universal Control Plane that aim at making this simpler. And they are supposed to cost a lot of money so that Docker can pay my salary. Um, okay. Docker Cloud is Tutum, right? Uh, yeah, Docker Cloud is the rebranding of Tutum, yeah. Um, what's next? Yeah, last thing before we can open for questions or whatever. Or um, this, I, I do this workshop twice a month. So I, I did it last month in LA. I did it last uh, Monday in Paris. Uh, I'm going to deliver it in Berlin and London next month, and Budapest, and probably Munich in April, and Austin and Portland in May, and probably Seattle for BarkerCon in June. Um, this is not to say, I, I'm not inviting you to follow me in this world tour, uh, but there is the repo and I'm putting one tag for each workshop, so if like in a couple of months and you want to say, okay, what's the current status, you don't have to go through the whole deck again, you can just do a diff between the tag that I will put for this workshop and, and the current tag to see what has changed. Um, that's it. I'm almost out of voice, so if you have questions. What's the recommended for deployment?
<coughs> what's the recommended way to deploy console? Yeah, together with the other amounts of super machines. Um, so, according to a discussion I had with someone from HashiCorp, because I, I have very little prod experience with console, but um, initially I thought, hey, that's cool, you can just put console on every node and everything was great. He told me, no, don't do that. Um, you want to have five, maybe seven, maybe nine console nodes, but more than that is probably not a good idea uh, because the Raft protocol um, slows down when you have more nodes because you have to wait for half of the nodes to uh, confirm the, the write. I so, server some up or agents of the console. Right. So what you want servers. to do is to have like five, seven, nine servers and the rest of them being normal agents. Oh. So what I would say is if you have a small number of nodes, like you have let's say less than 20 nodes, I think it's still okay to have everybody being a server because it won't be too terrible. Now if you have more than that, you should probably have a small group of nodes being special, like there will be servers. Maybe you want like five nodes be um, console servers and also swarm managers and also maybe your private registry or you know and, and then you have a bunch of normal nodes. Yeah. <coughs> Could this work uh, across data centers? Can work across data centers? Uh, yes, but <coughs> um, so the Swarm API is pretty lightweight, so if you have like uh, if you have managers across multiple data centers, that's okay. However, um, if your application is running across multiple data centers, the network latency will kill you. So in that case, what I would do is uh, make sure that the engines are started with tags. I didn't tags. I, I didn't cover tags at all, but you can put tags on your engines. So you can say like this is Europe, this is East Coast, this is West Coast, this is Asia, and then when you run, you can do like a, a Docker run, a dash e affinity colon node something equal. I, I mean just note like because that's <laughs> but basically when you do Docker run, you can put extra parameters to give affinity. Like I want this container to run on a node that has this tag, like it has the Europe tag. And so you can start your whole stack of containers in Europe or in Asia or or on or, or sometimes it's for databases, so you want to start the database on a node that has a SSD. So when you set up the nodes, you put tags like SSD or high CPU or um, if you, if you know that it's a machine that is going to be removed next in the next six months, you can put a special tag and so on and so on. So that when you start your containers, you can give this information to Swarm. <coughs> Swarm will uh, follow your, gu your guidelines. So in that case, I would make sure that the whole application is running within the same data center. <coughs> and except if you want to do failover, and then in that case, you put like, one stack, the other stack, load balance rigid form, just like with ability zones on the uh, on AWS. Can you change the tag to the running node? Uh, sorry. Can you change the tag to the running node? Can I change the tag of the running node? the tag of the running node. Um, I don't know. I know that um, in Engine 110, one of the new features is uh, Docker config thing that allows to update some parameters live, not all of them, and I don't know if tags are in this, but if they are not, they will be shortly because that would be the most obvious use of the of this feature. Why? Why would you do it? Huh? Why would you do it? Uh, so I think the idea here would be to put a tag like. Uh, okay to deploy on this node, you know, so when, when there is a node that you want to drain, you can remove the, the, the okay tag on it so that no new container go to that thing. Um, that, yeah. No other questions?
conditions. Is it sufficient to have, for example, a multi-tenant docker machine? Multi-tenant docker machine. Um, you mean like docker machine, like uh, the docker machine tool, or multi-tenant docker nodes? So you're not gonna have uh, multiple nodes, and I want to have multiple users of one container, so they can see each other's mm. containers and kill each other's containers. Yes. Um, there are a couple of things in progress on that. Um, the first layer will be an optimization layer that will have like role-based access control on different objects. Um, that, that part is pretty tricky because it's always the same thing, like it's easy to add a feature, but uh, when, once it's there and people rely on it, it's hard to remove it. Uh, so I, I, I can't really tell what it will look like. Uh, we, obviously, that's something that we're working on, but I, I don't know what, what will retain. A while ago, we had this idea that we could have something like Swarm, but like basically, you have this big cluster, and you have your own Swarm Manager. So your Swarm Manager only sees your containers, and that way it's a super easy way to scope resources, but that's not what we decided to do. So, but yeah, we're working on that. All right. Well, thanks. Okay.